Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all and welcome you to Treminus this morning. If you're visiting with us, it's great to have you here. And we trust and pray you feel at home as we meet together for worship. We'll be sharing later on in our service in communion. And if you're from another congregation and you know and love the Lord as your saviour, we invite you to share with us around his table this morning. A few things to mention by way of announcements. Any members of committee who are present this morning, just a brief gathering, a brief meeting in the kitchen after this morning's service. So members of committee, um, just for a couple of minutes in the kitchen after church this morning. And then tonight at half past six, we have our once a month evening service and we call it Real Life Faith. And that's at Red Rock this month. So we alternate um, Red Rock are hosting Real Life Faith tonight at half past six. And I'm going to be interviewing one of our elders, Johnson Reid, over at Red Rock tonight. And there'll be some worship, there'll be tea and coffee and a biscuit. And then we'll be cha- I'll be chatting with Johnson about life and faith, where he was brought up, school, working with young people. Um, I was going to say how we see the world, but that's maybe a bit dangerous, Johnson. But we will have a good chat tonight about life and faith. And I trust it will do all of you good um, as we reflect together on God's grace in our lives. Just a couple of things further down the line, Friday the 22nd, which is this Friday coming, Youth Club have a mystery night from 8 to 10, so secondary school is young folks, you're welcome at that. And then next weekend on the Sunday night, our youth fellowship group, we're going to AYC, which stands for Armagh Youth Connect, and that's at the Temple Church in Keady, and we'll give you more details regarding time um, for that next weekend. Um, But young folks of secondary school age, um, come along with us. Um, There are young people's groups, Sunday night groups from around our locality and we get together two or three times in the winter and one of those nights is next Sunday night. Just to mention at this stage as we move towards the end of the year, if you'd like to subscribe to the Presbyterian Herald or Wider World magazines, um, speak to Alan or Heather out there over the... um, (laughs) Heather's waving just about. Um, Speak to Alan or Heather by the 15th of December, um, if you'd like to to order and subscribe um, those magazines for next year. Those are all the announcements. Let me read to you words from Romans chapter five, which pertain to what we're going to do later on. And they're a reminder of how we can be here this morning, and you're saying, well, Sam, I can be here this morning because I got out of bed. I'm here this morning because I was able to drive a car and get to Draminus. Partly true, but more than that, you can be here as part of God's family. You can be here as an adopted child of God because of what we read in Romans 5, where Paul writes, and he says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. We're going to worship him as we stand and sing together. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Let's worship God as we stand.
our seats together. We've been singing about God's love and God's power and God's presence. And nowhere are those things more precious and evident to us than when we come to share around his table. Let's turn to God together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, how many times have we come to worship and we've used words like your holiness and your wisdom and your power and your love. And Father, we know these words are true. They speak of your character, your unchanging, perfect, wonderful (coughs) character because you're God and there is no other. But Lord, this morning in a special way, as we come to communion, how we see and sense these qualities in you that are not found in us naturally. And we see them as we share together at the Lord's table. Father, thank you that it's a a table reminding us of your perfect holiness, that you are without sin. And we come today so desperately needy because of our sin. Father, thank you for a plan in perfect wisdom that levels us all before you. Father, thank you for a love demonstrated in your body broken, your lifeblood poured out, that while we were still sinners, you reached to us in love. Father, thank you today that the words that Paul wrote in Romans 5 are our story as we trust in Jesus. Father, thank you that it's possible for us to be justified and made right through Jesus. Thank you that today this table speaks of peace with God through the blood of the Lord Jesus shed for our sin. God, how we thank you this morning that as we've come in these doors into a building, the table reminds us that Through Christ we come into your presence. Access into the grace in which we now stand. Father, how we thank you this morning that even though we deserved your wrath and your judgment, in Christ you've shown us mercy and dealt with us graciously. So Lord, this morning as we turn to you in worship together, remind us again of the blessings and the benefits that are ours in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you today that for those of us who know Jesus as our saviour, we've been adopted into your family. Thank you that our sin has been removed as far as east is from the west. Father, thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit that you live in us and we rest in you. And so Father, even as our young people have already come together in Sunday school and Bible class and opened up your word and you've been with them there, so too, Lord, we pray that as we turn to you in worship, that you would be with us here. That as we're still before you, that we would experience and taste something of the power of the Lord moving in this place. Father, thank you for all that the week has held in terms of the food we've eaten, the homes we've come from, the families that we've loved, we come to you this morning to say thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you. So help us as we worship. Help us as we draw near. And Lord, minister to us by your spirit. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's the passage that we, we, we use as we gather at the Lord's table. But I want to reflect on two or three things together this morning. And to do that a wee bit differently, I'm going to need the boys and girls' help in a wee minute or two before they go out to children's church. And so, boys and girls, usually I know on Communion Sunday you end up staying where you are. But I'm going to bring you up to the front for a wee minute. Um, and I'm going to need your help as we think about communion together. So, first of all, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's on page 1152. And we're going to read from verse 17 down to the end of the chapter. 
this is God's word. Where Paul writes and he says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. But when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. But the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anybody's hungry, you should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. When I come, I will give further directions. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Now, boys and girls, special Sunday, um, Communion Sunday. And I am going to get you to come over to this side. And we're going to sit over on these seats. So come over carefully. Don't trip up on the table in the middle. But come on and join me um, over on these seats over here. Great. Come on past. There's a row here. There's plenty of seats in there. And there's another row in behind as well if you need them. Wow, good to see you all. So some of you can sit there and then go into the next row and there's a next row as well. Don't be scared. The people in the rows behind don't bite. Great, you go into the next. Some of you guys could go into the third row there. Good stuff. Great, there's more room. Guys, you come on around to me. Come on around here and we'll slide you all in here. Philip will look after you, don't worry. <laughs> Great. All we get in. Guys, you have come to church on a special Sunday. Well, every Sunday in my eyes is special. Good man, Sam, can we get you hopped up too? Is there room, girls, can we make space for a Sam? Hop, hop, good lad. Great. Okay, every Sunday that we come to church is special. But this morning, whenever you go out to children's church, we're going to do something special here in church as the grown-ups. Did you notice anything different in church this morning? Yeah, Alfie, what did you notice? Good. Yes, you noticed there, there are cups, wee cups with a red drink in it. And then, does anybody know what might be under? Yeah, I'm going to lift it and bring it over so that you can see. Look, in the plate, there's little bits of bread. So there are little cups of red juice, and there are little pieces of bread. Do you have any idea... Don't shout out, but do you have any idea why those are sitting there this morning? Go for it, Emily. Because it's Communion Sunday, you're right. And what do you think the wee cups of red juice and the wee bits of bread remind us of? Yeah? Yes, Jesus' last meal with his disciples and the last things that he said. But what do you think the bread and the wine remind us of or represent? Good man. James? Good boy. The wine reminds us of Jesus' blood when he died and his hands were pierced and his feet 
on his side. So we remember that when he died, his blood poured out, yes. And what about the bread? What do you think it reminds us of, Jethro? His body. And it's broken up into little pieces. And I'm going to talk to the mums and dads a wee bit about that later on because Jesus was broken for us. But what I want to ask you this morning, first of all, because I've got three things to say to the whole congregation. I'm going to do the first one now with the boys and girls, and then I'm going to move on to the mums and dads later on. But the first word I want to talk about this morning is preparation. Does anybody know what preparation, what does that mean? To prepare. Brilliant, good girl. To prepare means to get something ready. Here's your first question, looking over this way. Who do you think prepared this meal for us this morning? Now, there's a clue. There's some people sitting near it. Who do you think organized the stuff that's sitting on the table? Okay, Jeff, we'll go again. The elders, yes. Look, these gentlemen are called elders not because they're old, but they're not. (laughs) That is not why we've... You could be an elder when you're 23 or 4 or 5. You don't have to be 55 or older. Sorry, those of you who are under 55. (laughs) They, these gentlemen, have the job with me to look after the life of our church, to work out the things that we should be doing, the things that should be really important to us. And today, they've got us prepared for communion. But... Did you know that God doesn't just want a a little meal prepared on the table? He tells us that we've got to get prepared for communion. Not by putting our clothes on, though you've got your nice clothes on, that's good. Not by brushing your teeth or brushing your hair, but you've done that and that's good. God wants his people to prepare to come to the table in a different way. And I want you to help the mums and dads to prepare. How about that? Could you do that with me? Great. Okay, we're going to look at some pictures. Here's the first one. What is that? You're right. What is it? A mirror. And what do you do in a mirror? You see yourself. You look in and you see yourself. In the Bible passage that I just read, Paul wrote and he said to people who were thinking about coming to the table to share in this special meal, to remember Jesus' death, he said, you need to examine yourself. You need to look in the mirror. Not to see what you look like, what your face is like, what your hair is like, but actually to look a bit more deeply and to realize what you're like on the inside. When you look at yourself in the mirror, are you happy enough with what you see? Yeah, I'm glad. The boys and girls are happy enough with what they see. Maybe we get a wee bit older and we're a wee bit less happy with what we see in the mirror. If we're really honest, boys and girls, there's other stuff that the mirror doesn't show that's happening inside. Some of the words that we say, some of the things that we watch, some of the ways that we act, some of the attitudes that we have, and they're not good. And God sees them. And he says, if you're going to come to the table this morning, you've got to look deep inside and look at yourself and realize we're not all that we should be. Here's the second thing that I want you to see. What's that? A ruler. ruler. Excellent. What do you use a ruler to do? To To measure. Yes, to measure stuff. You could measure things. You could measure yourself. If you had a big, long ruler or a measuring tape, you could measure how tall you are, couldn't you? The second thing that we do this morning when we come to church, to come to the the special table, to come to communion, we measure ourselves against God's perfect standard. Do you think we measure up? Nope. Let me tell you a story. The people that Paul was writing to in a church in a place called Corinth, they were coming to share in God's special meal, and actually, they weren't doing it very well. They were coming and they were bringing picnics with them. And if you had lots of money, you brought a big picnic and you had a big feast. And there might be somebody else and he had nothing. And he came to communion to to the Lord and he just had a, a small bite to eat. And then you were all coming to do this special part of the meal. And some people felt very left out. And their attitude to each other wasn't good. And they weren't measuring up to God's perfect standard. None of us do. Mummies and daddies, this is for you more than the boys and girls. We don't come 
and share at the Lord's table because we think we're good enough to. We come and share in <laughs> communion because God, by the Holy Spirit, has helped us realize that we don't measure up. And we never will. Never. And yet he is willing to do something so that we can come to him and be accepted. I have one more picture for you. A sign. A sign. It is a sign. So you're out driving on the road. What do you think that sign tells your daddy or mom? None of you are driving on the road. Okay. <laughs> what does that sign tell you to do? Good girl? Yeah. Yes. What do you think? It, you've got a bit of help from down the end here. Absolutely 100%. That sign tells you do a U-turn. Boys and girls, mums and dads, grannies and grandas, the most important preparation as we come to the table this morning is that not only do we see ourselves properly as people who fall short and don't measure up, but we turn around and we say sorry. Boys and girls, can I get your help for one last little thing? Could you do something and help me in it? Could you say, I'm sorry, after three? One, two, three. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Have you ever done it this way, where mummy or daddy have told you you've done something wrong and you go, I'm sorry. Have you ever done that? <laughs> and you, don't, you sort of mean it, but you don't really mean it. Or, or, listen, have you ever whispered under your breath, sorry, but you don't really mean it? Or maybe you've said it really, really convincingly. Oh, I am so, so sorry. I am really sorry. And then do you know what you do? You go around the corner and you do the same thing again. Have you ever done that? You've said sorry, but it's almost like you've got fingers crossed behind your back and you go and do the same thing again. You don't do that when you're coming, preparing to come to God's special table. We re look in the mirror and we realize I'm not all that I should be. I don't measure up to God's perfect standard. But when I say sorry... I mean it. And I'm going to show that I mean it by doing what? You turn. Turn around. Go a new direction. Boys and girls, this is what preparing to come to communion is all about. It's seeing ourselves properly. It's seeing God properly. He's perfect and we're not. And it's coming and saying sorry properly. To turn around. Turn away from our sin and follow Jesus. Boys and girls, what I want you to do quietly is to go back to your mums and dads because I'm not finished. There's a wee bit more that I'm going to do before you go out. So if you go quietly go back to mums and dads, I'll go to the pulpit. Thank you for helping me with this bit. So you find your way back round to where you were. Just as we think, a, a wee tiny bit more about our preparing to come to the Lord's table. I'm going to put up on the screen four words for all of us, not just for the boys and girls, and then we're going to pray together, and we're all going to do that. But as we come to the table this morning, our preparation is that we humble ourselves, that we don't think more highly of ourselves than we should. We're not coming and sharing in communion, saying, polish my halo, I'm a good boy or girl. We're coming humbly, realizing our sin. We're coming in need. We're coming and saying, Lord, we know that we have no hope without you. We have no hope unless you forgive us. We come grateful. We're saying thank you for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And we can come confidently because God has made a way open. I'm going to put a prayer on the screen and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to read it now and then we're going to have a, just about 30 seconds quietly. Do you remember last Sunday at Remembrance Sunday with, 30, with a minute? Quietly. Just a moment quietly for each of us to come preparing ourselves. To think about ourselves in the mirror, realizing the truth of our lives. To think of God's mercy to us in Jesus. And then after that wee moment of quietness, we'll, we'll read the prayer again together. Let me read it once 
and then quietly we'll just take 30 seconds to pray on our own and then we'll all read it again together. Let's pray. Lord, you see everything. Nothing is hidden from you. I want to be honest before you today to look in the mirror of your word and see the truth of how far short of your perfect standard I fall. By your Holy Spirit, enable me to truly repent, turning my back on sin, running to Christ in faith, and resting in him for forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. together let's pray um, using the words that are on the screen Lord you see everything nothing is hidden from you I want to be honest before you today to look in the mirror of your word and see the truth of how far short of your perfect standard I fall by your Holy Spirit enable me to truly repent turning my back on sin running to Christ in faith and resting in him for forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, even just as we keep ourselves prayerful, we're going to stand and sing together. It's a lovely hymn that we've learned over the last few months called Gentle and Lowly, reminding us of how our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, invites us to come to him and find in him that we can be forgiven. Let's stand. And then after this, boys and girls, you can go to Children's Church. Let's stand as we sing.
girls, you can go if you want to at this stage to children's church. I took time with the children this morning deliberately because after lots of years of leading a communion service and going through the routine that we go through on a communion Sunday morning, sometimes for all of us, and I include myself, you slip into the, the rhythm of this is what we do on communion Sunday. And if not for any of your sake, for my own sake, I wanted to break down what we do and try and reflect on that in a way that is helpful for our hearts, minds, our whole life in Christ together. And so, as I talked to the children, we were thinking about preparation for coming to the Lord's table. Examine yourselves. Judge yourself that you wouldn't fall into judgment. Come in repentance, saying a sorry that is not lip service, but a genuine intent to turn around and to follow Christ. So the second word that I want to speak to us about together is the word participation. I'm going to speak for six or seven minutes. And then after that, we're going to come and share around the Lord's table. And then I have one more word at the end that we proclaim. And we will do that at the end. But just to reflect for a moment on participation. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes, and he says that, what we do is a participation in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. You hear those phrases. There should be all sorts of questions are, are racing through your mind. What, what have I come to do today? What does it mean? What difference does it make? And three simple things that I've put on the screen are what I want to reflect on for a moment. First of all, symbols that speak in bread and wine of what Christ has done for us. There's a hymn that sometimes we sing that includes the words, here are symbols to remind us of our lifelong need of grace. Symbols, bread and wine, to remind us of our lifelong need of grace. Bread broken. At the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread, and when he broke it, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. The one who is the bread of life. The only one who could ever, the only man who could ever speak as the author of life. The one who we've read in John's gospel who's able to say, I have life in myself. And yet at the last supper he says, my body, which is broken for you. And while to fulfill prophecy, his bones wouldn't be broken. He would be pierced. Thorns would be put on his head. Nails in his hands and feet. Spear thrust into his side. He would be beaten. And he would die. A physical brokenness. <coughs> the like of which we can barely countenance. And to think that it's visited on the Son of Man. The Son of God our saviour. But he wasn't merely physically broken in our place. More than that, in his sin-bearing death, he takes the wrath of God that you and I deserve and he takes it upon himself. There's a breaking as darkness descends at the cross that we can't fully grasp. We come to church this morning and we worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit indivisible Godhead. And yet at the cross, the Father turns his face away as the Son bears the just punishment for our sin. There is a brokenness and a fracturing in that moment that we will never fully understand this side of heaven. A brokenness so that you could be healed. Isn't that the, the, the contrast? 
something broken or fixed or healed. The table is we take tokens of bread, remembering Jesus' body broken. I'm remembering as I share at this table, Christ was broken. His relationship with the Father was in that moment broken for me as he bore my sin. And it speaks to me of the possibility of restoration. The possibility of coming back to God. Of belonging to him. This struck me this week. And I say it carefully. In an age when the mantra is so often, this is my body. In both issues surrounding birth and end of life. Into that spirit of the world we live in, the Son of God says, this is my body and it's given for you that you might live. And then we'll take the cup, the cup of the new covenant and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The wine we'll drink symbolizes his blood, his lifeblood drained. He dies so that I might live. It's the cup of the covenant. A new arrangement by which I no longer bring sacrifices to church to have sin dealt with. He drinks the cup of God's judgment so that I don't have to. His cup is the bitter cup. But even as I drink this cup this morning, I'm reminded of the joyful sweetness of having sins forgiven. Cup of forgiveness cup that overflows, as the psalmist called it, the cup of salvation. But that's not all I want to emphasize. In one sense, if we had the symbols and they were our reminders this morning, we could come, and I say this reverently, we could come to church and we could look at them. We could look at cups of red juice of wine. We could look at pieces of bread and we could say collectively, this reminds us of Jesus. And we could go home again. But communion and Christ asks more and offers more. See, these are symbols to eat and drink. Eat this bread, drink this cup, physically participate. Now, you know and I know that one, the bread and the wine don't become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We know that. It's not that we are physically eating Jesus body and drinking his blood. We know that. But at the communion table, we're invited to participate in his body and blood. We're invited to eat and drink. This morning as we worship in this special way, we remember Christ is here. And as I eat and drink, I'm reminded all this was done for me. I'm forgiven and adopted. More than that, by faith he dwells in me. I've been joined to him in his death. He died for me and so I die to sin. So this morning when I take these symbols and I don't just look at them, when I eat and drink, I'm preaching to myself, Sam, Christ did this for you. Eat and drink, rejoicing that you have been joined to him by faith. That you're not a spectator. You're a participant. Let me read to you John 6. This is what Jesus says. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you've no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and they died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. My body is real food. My blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Whoever feeds on me will live because of me. Folks, don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that by virtue of eating and drinking and sharing in communion today that in some way that gives you eternal life. That's a 
a wrong sequencing of what I'm saying. But I am saying that this meal, as I participate by faith, as I remember Jesus' death for me and my union to him by faith, I'm saying to myself, I'm preaching to myself, Sam, this is your life. Christ has died for you. You dwell in him. He dwells in you. Symbols, symbols to eat and drink as we feed on him. Feed our hearts, feed our spirits. Symbols we eat and drink together. We're going to come to the table in a second, but just before we do that, Paul writes to the Corinthian Christians and he is disturbed by their behavior in 1 Corinthians 11. It's all about their gathering. They should be one in Christ Jesus. They should be considerate of each other, but it wasn't like that. And Paul's reprimanding them because this is a fellowship meal where they not only share communion with God, but they participate in communion together. They eat it together. Joined by the Spirit, washed in his blood, part of the body, the church of God. We'll not do it just yet, but I could ask you to look around and look at those sitting beside you. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Communion with God and with them. Long after your blood relatives have gone to their graves, long after your earthly family is parted in all sorts of different ways that one day our earthly families are parted. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are yours eternally. Symbols to remind us of Christ's death. Symbols that we eat and drink, participating in and remembering the blessings and the benefits that are ours as we're joined to Christ by faith. Symbols that we eat and drink together, acknowledging the body of Christ. And even thinking how in the week ahead I will live as part of the body of the Lord Jesus here at Reminis and wherever the Lord takes me. We're going to sing as we come to the table and then I have one last thing to share at the end. But we're going to sing um, words that we've used on many occasions as we come to the Lord's table. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us, and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. We're going to sing these words together um, and then at, towards the close of this um, hymn or even during this hymn if the elders would receive communion tokens from you our communion tokens are merely that we can keep record of who's been in, in attendance at the lord's table if you haven't one of those filled in at this stage don't panic and um, you can do that afterwards but as i said at the beginning if you know and love the lord as your savior and you belong to another congregation we invite you to share at his table let's stand as we sing behold the lamb
table of our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't belong to any single denomination. So if you are from another congregation of Christ's church and you know and love the Lord Jesus and you're a communicant member there, we welcome you to share with us today. Let's pray briefly together. Father, thank you that by the Holy Spirit you prompt us to prepare for this simple meal. Lord, we look into the mirror of your word, we see your perfect holiness, and we realize that we simply don't measure up. We fall short in word and deed, and thought and action. <coughs> How we bless your holy name, that in Christ you have provided a way for us. And that as we come truly repenting, enabled by the Holy Spirit, to receive Christ as our Savior. Then, Father, we approach your table confident that you accept us, that you forgive our sin, you remove our sin as far as east is from the west. Lord, once your enemies, now seated at the table. Jesus, thank you. Lord, help us to participate properly and wisely, recognizing the body of Jesus Christ broken for us, his blood poured out and shed for us. Lord, might our participation today be by faith a true feeding on our Savior. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. And so according to the, the example and the command of the Lord Jesus that we read earlier from 1 Corinthians 11, and for a memorial of him, we do this, that the Lord in the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the elders distribute the bread and you hold on to the, the bread and we'll eat together, before we do that, and I'll use these words again, his body broken for you do this in remembrance of him. Could I invite you at that stage, with bread in hand, to, with me, look around at those beside you, and collectively, we'll say, his body, broken for you. Let's do that together, when we receive um, the bread, and we wait, and then we participate together.
before we eat, we can turn in a moment and say to each other, his body broken for you, this do in remembrance of him. His body broken for you, this do in remembrance of him. And then in the same manner, the Lord took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And again, we'll do the same as we receive our our little cup. We'll hold on to it. And then we'll participate and speak those words to each other um, as we share in the cup together. So together in a moment we'll say, his blood shed for you, this do in remembrance of him. Let's do that together. His blood shed for you, this do in remembrance of him. Preparation, we examine ourselves properly. Participation, 
We realize that by faith, we're joined to Christ. We dwell in him. He dwells in us. And finally, one more word. Proclamation. Paul finishes his instructions by saying that as you share in this meal, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. By coming to church this morning as someone who knows and loves Jesus as your savior and sharing around his table, God's word tells you that you're preaching the gospel. This is a visible, tangible testimony to the world that Christ has died for us, that Christ is the savior of the world, that this is the good news that the whole world needs to hear. You proclaim, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. You preach it to yourself. You preach it to the person beside you, that this is true, this is what God has done for us. You preach it to our children, to our young people, as you explain to them what we did this morning, that you shared in, you proclaim the Lord's death for sinners. You preach it to unbelievers. When you go to work tomorrow, when you go to your friends this afternoon, where were you? Well, I was at communion. What were you doing there? I was remembering the death of my Savior for me. And in that, you preach the gospel. The second thing that you do is you proclaim his death, identifying that you belong to Jesus. As we've shared in these elements today, we've remind ourselves, reminded ourselves, he did this for me. You remember Peter in the courtyard with the fire burning and the servant girl saying, Peter, are you with them? But Peter says, no. Don't know them. Are, are you with him, Jesus? No, don't know him. And eventually, in brokenness, Peter would weep, and later on, he would identify with Christ and come and speak to him. And Jesus came and spoke to him on the lake shore. Peter realized, you and I need to realize this morning, that participating in the Lord's table is a proclamation to the world and to my own soul that I belong to him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So counterculturally. Paul reminds us. Your life is not your own. You were bought at a price. That price being the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a world that is obsessed with self-determination. <clears throat> Counterculturally, we speak in the words of the Savior. He says, this is my body given for you. We, in response, in faith, say, I am not my own. I've been bought at a price. And so I will live that life, belonging to him. I'll step out from Draminus this morning under new management and join to him in his death and resurrection. Sin and its mastery over me is dead. Resurrection, life in Christ by the Spirit, is mine. And I'll live that life. We preach the gospel, we belong to Christ, and we await his return. Paul says, as you share in this meal, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus had already prefixed in the, the last supper, he said, look, this is the last time I'll share in this until more fully the kingdom of God comes and anticipating a day when I'll share in this meal with you in my Father's kingdom. When we come and share in communion, we prepare ourselves, we participate, we identify ourselves as belonging, joined to Christ by faith. And we say we will do this until he comes again. The words that I've already quoted as I prayed. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. This is a foretaste of the day that is coming down the line. And I'm reminding myself this morning that the one who spoke these words for us to share in today, the one who explained their significance, 
is returning to feast with his people. This morning, as I've prepared and we've prepared, as we've participated together, we now go from here to proclaim in gladness the good news of the gospel that the world needs to hear. To proclaim in thankfulness that I belong to Christ and I live as his. To proclaim that he's coming back. And resting in him, I'm ready for that day. We proclaim, we preach onto the day of his return. Let's join in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege that we share in this morning of coming together around your table. Lord, we don't come to you presenting any works of our own righteousness, but simply clinging to Christ. We thank you that clothed in him, we are accepted by you. And so Lord, we pray that you'd take us out into the world to live and speak for Jesus. Lord, might we share in something of the overflowing cup this morning, the gladness of knowing sins forgiven, peace with God, and this sure hope of heaven for those who belong to him. Lord, thank you for this meal and all it represents. And we pray that by the Spirit, you would indwell and empower us for all the works that you have for us to do onto the day that Jesus comes again. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to finish as we sing together, there's a higher throne than all this world has known, where faithful ones from every tongue will one day come. Let's use these words as we worship and rejoice in not only what has been done for us, but what lies ahead for those who know Jesus. Let's stand as we sing.
Father, how we thank you for the truth of what we've sung, that your throne is established and you reign forevermore. And so, Lord, we pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus, the wonderful love of God, and the fellowship and companionship of the Holy Spirit would rest upon us now and forevermore. Amen.